Dr. Yu Tao, welcome to BRI Dialogues. It's 28th of October, 2022. We much appreciate you joining us a while on the road and uh, from Malaysia. I wanted to kick off by asking you to peel the onion from where you are sitting as to what we should expect from the 20th Party Congress just a few days ago, and the whole drama in and around it, from who came, who was ushered out of the meeting, and what does this mean for China and the world, not only in terms of the continuity, but macro geoeconomic politics and geo strategy? Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ali uh, Anush, for having me. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to talk about this important. Uh, topic in, in, in such a timely uh, manner? Well, I mean, a very big question. Uh, so, uh, but I think, you know, lots of the focus so far on the media has been on the dramatic moves, uh, such as, you know, uh, you know, a thousand time, a thousand dif different speculations on, you know, what happened to Hu Jintao. Was that planted or was that just an incident? Now, I think uh, there might never be those questions because for many people on many occasions, the internal politics of the Communist Party of China, especially the top politics, that's always a black box. Um, and why the party Congress, even though many people just a ceremonial thing, you know, like a performance, uh, like a show, but I think that's still important because a party Congress you know, no matter how boring it appear to be, uh, apart from those, you know, dramatic moments, uh, they always reveal two important things. The first one is who, who is going to lead China for the next five years and arguably longer. And the second question is what the new leadership is going to do. Now, I think we got answers now for both questions. Uh, the first question, not uh, surprising, I suppose, for all of the China watchers, that President Xi Jinping uh, now, you know, got his third turn as a party general secretary uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, Communist Party of China, uh, which, according to the political arrangements in China, is very likely that uh, is one he's going to be the president of the People's Republic of China for the next five years. Uh, so. That's not surprising, I suppose. I'm going to talk about the implication of that in, in one more minute or two. That, you know, uh, the other thing is that she gave a oral report on behalf of the 19th Politburo uh, to the Party Congress on the beginning uh, day, on the first day of the Party Congress. And since then, you know, uh, that report has been approved uh, by the Party Congress. Now, for many people, especially uh, you know, when I was a kid, when I listened to watch this kind of a party congress report, I feel that they're extremely boring. You know, full of political dragons, and then you know, some dragons repeated in uh, in, in different congresses. However, a, a, as I grow older, as I study a bit more, I find that uh, you know, if you are really a good uh, scholar or researcher, you can analyze. You know what has changed and what has not changed since the you know uh, uh, the last party congress, and I think there are at least four kind of uh, key things we can observe from his report. Now, Ali, you asked me let's not focus on the continuity there, but talk about the change. But I would say that the the biggest uh, feature, uh, the biggest kind of a characteristic you can you can interpret from this party congress report is that I think lots of things going to be continued in China. That includes his leadership. That, but that also includes, you know, some of the initiatives that she has uh, laid out for China in his first two terms, including the Bell and Row Initiative, which I understand is the topic of these theories, but also some of the new initiatives recently rise up, including the Global Security Initiative, which is fairly new. That was raised back in April this year, April 2022. Now, a little bit like the Bell and Row Initiative, when it was first raised, it was raised in this international forums, international conference. Um, and at the beginning, 
Now people know that that that's you know something new, something grand from the central leadership. But what exactly is that there? It wasn't very. I mean, it became clear during the years when China gradually, you know, kind of materialized some of these initiatives. This global security initiative initiative is similar to that. Uh, so far, the foreign ministry uh, of China, their spokespersons, their vice minister and minister has, uh, you know, and, and some diplomats has written articles about that. But there's huge rooms to for 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 interpretation. Uh, but I mentioned that because that links to the second feature of the what we can observe from from the party congress, which is that national safety and national security. That's emphasized very much more than before. Uh, because what, what you can observe is that each party congress has several chapters. Now, she mentioned national security back in 2017. So it wasn't entirely, an, but this time, this has become a separate chapter there. So in terms of that, uh, I think that we, we will see more emphasis on the national security, and there will be an emphasis on coordinating the internal security and the internal security there. Now that links with the uh, so-called, you, you know, what, what I said that she's new, new, new initiative, the global security initiative. While this, we're not entirely sure about what exactly there is, but I think a core uh, kind of a argument there is that and according to the global security initiative is that no country should pursue its own national security at the expense of other countries national security now it's a bit mouthful but you look at the for example what russia has been arguing regarding its 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 reason to invade ukraine uh then its argument is that uh, the the extent it's it, extension of NATO actually starts to threat Russians' national security. Um, however, I mean, if you apply Xi's global security initiative, it could be argued the other way, because Russia probably also doesn't have the right to invade another country just to, to protect its own national security, because it directly violate other countries' national security. So I propose this national security initi uh, global security initiative is to argue for less conflicts there and, and a more stable international order there. So I'll be quickly about the third and fourth features there. Um, and, and the third one is that, uh, uh, which is linked with what, with what I'm talking about, Ukraine situation. I think there are certain you know narratives that has been adopted, uh, especially this narrative called that the China will make its policy and decisions based on the issues on their own merits. That's a phrase that the Chinese foreign ministry mm -hmm. has been, uh, you know, taking using since the Russian-Ukraine conflicts um, since February, mm -hmm. you know, March. But it, initially, it really gives China some kind of a strategic ambiguity to maneuver in terms of this international kind of a move. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I think it's very unlikely China is going to follow the West to sanction on Russian. Uh, that's very unlikely. But on the other hand, it's probably also unlikely for China under the current circumstance to materialize or to Russia. So it, it hasn't support any material support, right? Hero support to, to Russia. And, and that's, you know, I, I think this kind of ambiguity allow China to, to choose this kind of a position in the middle uh, according to the circumstance. And finally, I think one thing that we are going to see, uh, we can read from the Party Congress report is that there is kind of the emphasis on the what I call development driven uh, yeah. diplomacy. That link the topic of your series, which is Bell and Row Initiative. So with that, I think Bell and Row Initiative is, initiative is not going to go away. Quite the opposite, uh, in the next five years or even longer, that will remain one of the major foreign policy vehicles of China's engagement with the world. So I will stop there. You, you, that now. was a, that that was a that was a might, mighty ocean that 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 you have unrolled for us, and that was a classic summary of the main takeaways um, from the 20th Party Congress. Um, 
I want to play devil's advocate for a minute and say that there is this, this apparent, perhaps inherent contradiction in China wanted to be a global power and wanted to avoid, at the same time, not wanting to get involved, get it hands dirty in what are global insecurity issues. Um, it's one thing to adopt a position, it's another to act on a position. So how sustainable do you think this position of diplomatic ambiguity can continue? One question. The other is, like you, I'm also very interested in the Global Security Initiative, and I'm also intrigued by its vagueness, its, its security, if you like, with Chinese characteristics. Um, do, you, do you think it is being tabled partly in response to managing the BRI on the one hand, and partly a response to AUKUS and the other Western-driven security initiatives in the in the Pacific. Here, I'm stealing some of Ali's comments, so I'm sure he'll add to it when he comes in. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Anush. Two very, very interesting and challenging questions. The first one is, you know, how far China's strategical ambiguity can go. I think that that's not only depending on China's pursuit there, but also like, you know, American and, and the West, you know, how far they want to, you know, tolerate or contain China's, uh, you know, development or, or emerge there. Uh, I think for China, uh, basically, uh, because link what, what, what I said, you know, this increasing emphasis on, on national security or perceived national security. So on essential issues such as Taiwan and South China Sea, I think we will see an even more assertive China, a more confident China, and a China that probably is not going to shy to demonstrate its, its interest and its pursuit there, uh, even you know, uh, with the risk uh, of being into conflicts with the, you know, the West or, or other foreign powers on these essential national security areas. Now, in other areas, especially you know, countries which so far probably hasn't you know, so directly engaged with China uh, or, or doesn't, you know, uh, it's not perceived by China as in its core interests there. Uh, I think that uh, China will keep that uh, strategic ambiguity. Uh, and the reason that the China, the, the ambiguity is very limited uh, or, or limited to none, I, I think, uh, in issues like Taiwan, uh, less so in South China Sea, but more so in Taiwan, is because uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party has been in power for so long and the, the initial revolutionary legitimacy, even though it's still repeated and, and emphasized by the party, but I think even the party knows that probably is not the single pillow for its legitimacy. Its legitimacy really is built on you know, its economic performance, uh, but that's also under challenge at the moment. And, and then its legitimacy is also built on this national pride, uh, which of course is not exclusive to China. Like for example, Donald Trump has this slogan, make America great again. And honestly, long before Donald Trump, the Chinese Communist, uh, Communist Party has been saying this great renaissance of Chinese civilization, the Chinese, uh, the Renaissance, of course, is a very advanced English word. I think um, for ordinary people, <laughs> we don't talk in that way. Uh, but if we borrow kind of a Don Donald Trump's kind of a propaganda, I mean, you, you could easily uh, translate those uh, political discourse into making China great again. Because of this, you know, whoever lose Taiwan, they, they will not only lose Taiwan, but lose the entire China, I suppose. That's why, you know, uh, Back to your question, you know, the, the, the strategical ambiguity, I think, on the key national security issues, you're right. I mean, there, I think there's little room for China to maneuver. And if the West keep on pressuring China there, the, the uncertainty and, and the likelihood of conflicts is going to increase. Uh, and that's almost for sure. Uh, but I think uh, the fact that uh, China still adopt this kind of un ambiguous language itself, it's probably a sign, personally, I think, uh, uh, indicates that they're not willing to go for a full on, you know, standoff with the West. It probably still keeps certain retreat 
uh, positions for itself. Um, so Ali, you want to weigh in? I, I know Anush still have the second question, but I already forgot. No, no, he's very, he's very naughty. He packed both questions in one. That's, that's, he's, he's, you know, because of his brain elasticity, he serves and he does a backhand in the same serve, you know, as if you're playing tennis, two moves in one. But that's fine. I'll come to that in a second. I am a big fan of vocabulary and literature. And one of the things that separates these two camps as the bipolar world that we're coming in again is that we hear a lot American international rule-based order. Whereas in China, it's all initiative. It's very interesting. So it comes to, you know, Belt Road Initiative, Global Security Initiative. It's inviting because I stands for invitation as well. It's allowing other people to partake and shape as much as China will have a predominant role. A lot of media, uh, top journals from Wall Street Journal to Financial Times, you name it, all the business journals are now running with analysis that, oh, she is putting national security and pandemic policies because of that market will hurt. And I am baffled which leader in the world would not put national security and a pandemic first. Now, we may disagree with the length of lockdowns, but can you shed some light as to is this not a naive optic, one from the vocabulary, that rule-based order, but the rules we set in for the rest of Global South, whereas initiative. And the second one is that which world leader has the luxury of putting markets above national security and pandemic. Yeah, Ali, th th these are great questions, and and uh, I I will probably uh, sort of uh, keep a more open answer to the second one because it's really fascinating. But the first one, really, I think, thank you very much. That reminds me about Anush's second question I linked very well there, which is, look, I mean, China core is a vision of the new world order or alternative world order as initiatives, as he said. And I, I suppose that partially to do with the fact that uh, until recently, the international order was actually or defectually, you know, written by the West or written by, you know, uh, who has the power. I mean, during the Cold War, of course, uh, United States and Soviet Union, they kind of, uh, you know, interact uh, to, to create a world order. And then when Soviet Union collapsed, America was the only superpower for a few decades there. Uh, hence, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, any, any change, any suggestion for a change of the existing international order would be perceived by the countries who can benefit from the most of the existing uh, international order as a threat or as not playing according to the game, uh, because the rule has already been made there. Uh, so go back to Anoush's question first, and then I will come back, Ali, to you. Uh, so yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm just not very, um, very keen or very clear that China does not like, for example, United States uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And, and that's very clear. And then um, the, the Bell and Row initiative though was much earlier and whether or not that is, a, a, you know, maybe a, a response to Obama's, for example, the rebalance in uh, Asian Pacific. It, it could be, it could be the starting point of that. Um, so uh, to, to link Ali's question, you know, the reason that China called this initiative, I, I pause, at least at the beginning of this uh, grand international project, that China doesn't want to be perceived as a challenge, challenger. But, you know, the other thing is that I think even the Chinese leadership probably understand that, uh, you know, in terms of the international capacity, even though China's economy has increased quite a lot, uh, but you, if you consider the comprehensive national capacity, uh, including the military, uh, financial power, China is not, you know, on the same league as the United States. And let alone that United States got lots of allies, you know, in Asian Pacific and in Europe. So uh, for that, uh, I think it's a smart move for the Chinese leadership to say that this is an initiative. 
So people can choose to join this initiative or they can choose not to join that initiative. Uh, but what actually will happen is that as more and more uh, countries join the initiative, of course, it would have a global impact. And China actually does not, I think, recognize rule-based uh, international order. And that's said very clear in its official discourse. And if we look at the party Congress report closely, uh, it's very interesting that Xi Jinping used this term, uh, democratize. So China wants to democratize the international order, which means that China wants a, a you know a, a a more heavier sign in in the in the international order. But the the way that China do it is China never says that we want to you know have a better say there. China with the Belt and Road Initiative, I think China position itself as a developing uh, country, but as a big developing country. So whenever it makes a move, it tries to say that it's leading uh, or is is leading by example sometimes how the developing countries can reshape the international orders. So by that, I think China could argue, for example, even India, India not very keen on the Bell and Road Initiative at all. But I mean, China could argue that this is a something that, you know, the, the, the developing economies you know, could do to basically get a fairer kind of a share or return in the international order. Now, whether or not, you know, even though China called that as an initiative, but we can see from the Western discourse, uh, you know, I work in Australia, for example, uh, especially in the last Australian government, when the Australian uh, federal government was led by the Liberal Party, so basically uh, party, and then you can see that no matter how China package itself, uh, it was viewed as a direct threat to the uh, rule-based, uh, you know, in uh, as well. So on that, uh, you could also say that whether or not China has been very successfully uh, packaging itself to the Western audience, sure. I, I think there has been lots of critical analysis on uh, the extent of success of China's soft power engagements in the countries. And I have to say that uh, probably it hasn't been very successful judging from, you know, the reaction and perception on China in the West, not only among the Western leadership, but if you look at more recent empirical uh, public opinion on China in America and Australia, it's actually getting cooled uh, very dramatically. Now, one thing that I haven't done much research and I hope I would know more is that, you know, for example, outside the West, uh, people in Pakistan or people in Africa, people actually, you know, get lots of these investments there. Uh, how do they see China's, you know, reaction there? I suspect uh, that's probably different from, uh, you know, people in Australia. So that's something I think deserves lots of research. I know there has already been research, but I think there should be more research because I think journalists, I've been asked by a few journalists in the last few weeks, and they tend to say that, uh, uh, they tend to propose a dichotomy between China and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that uh, we can see a clear standoff sometimes, unfortunately, mm -hmm. between China and the West. Uh, especially by the United States, I think, but also its close allies, the UK and Australia, for example, the five I countries. Uh, but the five I countries are not the rest of the world. Uh, outside yeah. China and these countries, there's plenty yeah. developing countries, and their view can be very interesting. I don't think they will take, uh, you know, China, uh, one hundred percent, you know, as accept that because we also see that there are reports that, for example, NGOs in Africa accusing China not using local labor enough, mm. and there are other, you know, environmental NGOs in Southeast Asia criticizing, you know, China's envir environmental, uh, you know, investments. So there, you know, sometimes the criticisms on China's loans is that these loans do not have conditions. So whoever in power locally. For their political games might use this loan, but you know, sacrificing local people's long-term benefits there. So there are these kind of criticisms. But on the other hand, 
many of these countries' leadership also accept the loan, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes with you know some back and forth. Uh, so it ought to be one question ought to be asked is you know how those people who actually get the loan or participate in the Bell and Road Initiative, how they react to China's you know initiative, and and how, if they have to do a choice, uh, do they choose China's offer or do they choose uh, what uh, the proposers of the rule based international order is going to be offering there? I want to just jump in because I know I know she's coming up with another good double question to you, but <laughs> for uh, give, giving a shout not to BRI dialogues but to our guests. We've had some really outstanding guests from African continent who came in with really refreshing ideas and feedback on the very question you raised, you. And I encourage our audience to tune into some of our archives to listen to that and encourage you to do this as well. But Anoush, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ali. Actually, that was what I was going to say, that in the, in the 22 BR dialogues that we have recorded, there is so much meat in terms of issues that you've raised. So it's very timely you for us to remind our, our viewers and listeners to go back and, and look at, at this cumulative body of knowledge, which is being built thanks to experts like yourself. Um, it, when, when I look at um, the international system, you, I'm very conscious that there are maybe three reasons why China gets such a bad press. One is that um, it is a civil civilizational alternative. Um, it's not an upstart, you know, it has heritage, history, uh, and, and identity. The second is that China is the only modern major power which has emerged separate from the Western coalition. If you look at Forget the Soviet Union. That was, a, a, if you like, a polemical situation. We are now beyond that. If you if you look at any other emerging economy, none have ever posed a challenge to the West. China is the first and possibly the only one which can speak authority at the global level with a very different uh, soundbite than Japan or India or Republic of Korea or Brazil or Argentina or or Turkey or anybody else might have been able to do. That's the second reason why China seems to rob people the wrong way in the West. And the third, of course, is that you've already touched upon is its dramatic success. That actually, it may, it, even if they didn't want to present this as a success, the global South sees China as an alternative success. It has gone beyond, if you like, the new liberal order. The Beijing consensus is seems to be very different from the Washington consensus. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, China uh, wanting to be great again. Of course, the China dream has a very different that President Xi Jinping uh, has tabled has a different narrative to it. Nevertheless, I think China is a prisoner of its success. We are at a at a junction that China continues to build on the success of the Bretton Woods system for its own success, or it begins to diverge. And Ali and I have many a time discussed with our guests this problem of decoupling, right? That I'm sure Ali is gonna be addressing shortly as well. So given what I've said, do you see China paralleling the Bretton Woods system or actively seeking an alternative world order? Not a new world order, but an alternative world order. What is your reading of it? I think that's a that's a very good question, Anush, and that touch upon some kind of very in-depth structural issues in, in our time of our world. Now, I, I think actually, if China has the choice, uh, ironically, you know, it's a personal will, I think China probably would prefer to engage with the current international order because after all, China banned, as you said, you know, from the existing international uh, e economic order. Uh, I mean, China benefited from the globalization wave after the, uh, you know, Cold War, where that China had very cheap labor, but it's a labor 
with a uh, with a high quality in terms of, for example, literacy rate. Uh, so with that, actually, China benefit quite a lot. But the challenge there is that I think countries like China, I say countries like China, so not only China, but other countries, you know, they are probably not allowed to continue benefiting from that system in the way they used to be. And the uh, the 2008 fi global financial crisis, in my opinion, is one of these kind of, uh, you know, dividing uh, points. And and I have a theory here, it's a little bit complicated, but, but I hope you allow me to just elaborate here, which is, you know, I think that because, be because of the uh, globalization process, and we know that uh, uh, the the value chain and then the, the the division of labor, that you know, since the I think nineteen nineties onwards, lots of industrials in the West they kind of transferred into the into China or other countries where you know labor is cheap. It's actually not starting from China. It, it happened way before that. I think in nineteen seventies, you know, uh, the Southeast Asian, uh, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, or later, you know, Malaysia, they accept lots of these in uh, manufacturers uh, from the West. Um, however, you know, for a long time until the two thousand eight uh, financial crisis. Um, hi, Ali and North. And am I? Can you hear me? I feel sometimes you're frozen. Okay, good, good, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, 2008 financial crisis, before that, I think for a long time that, uh, you know, when this manufacturer left, for example, Europe and America, what you have is that gaming, capitalists and capital, they, they gain from, you know, this process. The workers actually, but that did, you know, serve your, Early 2000s, uh, in European countries, the American as well, it's normally... You Can you repeat what you just said? We lost you for one second. Can you just talk about the last one minute? Can you revisit that? Yeah, this, this is my biggest nightmare that the internet is not stable. Uh, but what I was trying to say is that, uh, you know, when this industrial uh, kind of... Uh, uh, capacity, the manufacturing uh, sectors, they moved to Asia, for example. Uh, of course, the capital who owns these manufacturers, they, they would benefit. But the in the Western countries, the, the working people, they would actually lose their job, for example. Or, I mean, their skills no longer fix what's left there. Now, however, you know, for about 15 years, you know, the late... 1990s, the early 2000s, in the West, in American, in uh, but mainly in European countries, it's mainly led by, uh, you know, left wing parties. But left wing parties embedded a, a, a capitalist kind of ideology, like you know, the third way, for example, uh, the 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 UK uh, Labour Party, and then they actually try to, in my opinion, you know, buy off lots of the labor or I mean ordinary people support uh, to that system by social welfare. And that all works well if globally the economic can keep on increase. Unfortunately, you know, the 2008 financial crisis stopped that kind of a circle. And what you observe is that the, these governments in Europe, for example, in the UK, they have no choice but start to engage with the austerity uh, kind of measures, which of course we understand is utterly unpopular. But what's, you know, not at that time, you know, um, I think what's unfortunate is that lots of nationalists uh, or opportunists, in my opinion, you know, politicians uh, in the West, in the UK, uh, you know, Boris Johnson being the latest of them, uh, but American people, uh, but they, even before Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage, they all cash on of, of this kind of structure, economic, structural economic change. So as a result, uh, you know, because the West is a, a, elect, a, a democracy based on elections, so people does have vote, and then it's actually easier sometimes when this, you know, uh, economic problems surfaced, 
uh, the 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 populist a uh, populist leaders kind of gained from these movements, and then they actually start to try to argue for uh, as you said decoupling or a uh, retreat from the global order. So I suppose it's not uh, China's choice, you know, to keep on playing the old game because the old game is no longer there. The people who used to play that game, they now have left the table. So what can China do or what can other countries do? I suppose uh, they actually want, want to start, want to continue in playing the, uh, you know, uh, the, the global trading uh, game. So they have to create something for themselves. But if they can, they could, in, hypothetically, if China could continue to play the old game that the old player didn't left the table, I suppose it didn't have to, you know, create a new new game for itself. In fact, you read the Party Congress report, I think there's pretty emphasis, much emphasis on China will continue and be opening, China try to engage with the uh, existing, for example, globalization process, because there has been speculations on, uh, for example, last year or so, that there has been this new frame called double circulars in China, which means that uh, some people interpret that means China will emphasize more and depends more on the internal uh, kind of economic circles, like internal purchase, internal demands and internal supplies. Now the party Congress actually make it a clear signal that this will not be uh, the, the only case. And China will remain opening, especially now I suppose they didn't say that because China still have a, a, a very strict COVID policy. But I guess even the Chinese leadership probably start seeing the word opening. And then it's the problem with the zero COVID case uh, strategy is that if everyone's doing that, then it's very effective. However, if everyone else not doing that, you, if it's just China closing its border, it's actually going to make uh, even you know China's implementation of zero COVID uh, strategy more and more difficult because all other countries more or less has opened. Um, so on that, I suppose China for its own benefits, it wants to keep on benefiting from the existing international trade, but uh, I suppose the Western powers does not want that to continue uh, for its own political gains there. Uh, so it's it's kind of a, if, even if China wants to play the old game, it has to find a new table. That's, I think, that some of the situation we are facing there. Sorry, right. I used such a long uh, way to tell. No, it was fantastic. To, to give a very simple, <laughs> a, a, a simple judgment, but by a, a tell long story. I want to I want to jump in with a commentary and um, um, for our audience, um, as you um, you have been the Chinese Government Award for Outstanding self finance Students Abroad, and that is an award that goes to just for the record the top 0.1% of, you know, the brightest of China going outside. And I think one thing that we are missing in the Western Hemisphere is human capital development. I know that when they were focusing on Shinkansen and the, you know, bullet trains, they allocated around 20,000 engineers <laughs> to whatever you want to call it, design or reverse, whatever engineer, but they, they allocate and they have such a big pool of human capital. And this is something we are missing in our calculation. I mean, you look at UK government in the past two months, we've had three, you know, prime ministers. Um, the, the, I get dizzy sometimes listening in the mornings to the radio program as who's the new minister for which portfolio. I mean, if you play dodgeball, you have less movement in a game like that. But my question to you is as follows. For many, Belt Road Initiative is a Belt Road inspiration particularly in Global South, for lifting up people out of poverty, 400 million is not a joke. It's more than the entire American population being left, uh, lifted out of poverty. If this decoupling really comes to uh, head on, can the common prosperity policy at home, even if China wants to play at that table alone or with new actors, maintain momentum? I know that China wants to play. I know that China would like to be at the table and in the casino, but if the casino wants to shut down, will China be able to gamble the common prosperity at home? 
Well, I, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big question, Ali. Um, you know, social scientists don't want to, uh, don't normally make predictions because our prediction normally wrong. <laughs> so, uh, um, read for us I, the tea leaves, read for us the tea leaves. Uh, <laughs> you don't give the businessman excuses to knock us off. <laughs> um, that's a very good question, uh, Ali. I mean, the, the, the short answer is I don't know, but I will give my uh, analysis there. Uh, well, I think China could, I mean, even if even the decoupling eventually came uh, into a reality, which is in itself, you know, uh, whether or not the world can actually decouple, uh, that remains a question there because arguably speaking, you know, COVID is like such a, um, I mean, I, I would say it's a good nature experiment, although I was hesitant to use anything good associated with COVID there. But I mean, for, for I think policy, makers and, and policy uh, analysts is such a ideal, excellent kind of uh, rare, you know, nature experiment that uh, the world was forced to shut down uh, in terms of the people flow, which without COVID, I think is unimaginable. But COVID did that. However, even with that, I think the trading and the financial flows, they were not entirely stopped. I mean, they were impacted, they were not stopped. So with that, if COVID wasn't able to completely, you know, shut down the global trade, can any politicians do that? Uh, I doubt. So there might be conflicts and, and other things. And what, one thing that we can observe and we should observe more deeply is the ongoing conflicts in, U in Ukraine. And it took the, European units or European countries such a long time to eventually shut down the purchase from Russians uh, gas and oil. Uh, I haven't, you know, are, are they still purchasing? I don't know. I mean, but they probably phrased the, yeah, they, it's lower down and then they phrased the price. But, you know, the, the consequence on every or ordinary people's life uh, I think that's very obvious there. I mean, UK is now almost November. When the winter comes, whether or not there's going to be a challenge, I don't know. Maybe, you know, how poor people are going to pay their gas bills. That's really a real challenge there. Uh, I think the whole world is watching here uh, as uh, how, you know, some decoupling or shutdown of the international trading system would uh, you know, challenge every people's kind of life, uh, people in the South and people in the North. So I suspect even increasing the uh, political standoff, um, the completely shutdown of the trade uh, is not likely to happen there. I, I have a now, quick comment there, you. I mm -hmm. wanna just jump in and just share something with you and Anush. I believe no, company will have the luxury of cutting off and running away from China. No company will have the luxury of cutting off and running away from US and Western Europe. The challenge and the net loss will be on new carbon footprint and emissions for building another infrastructure to mirror. So if you think about CO2 emissions, and I shut up in a minute, of creating a parallel supply chain platform, that is mind boggling. And I stopped there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we lots of these things. We do have the scale uh, of economy, so building two systems, uh, it's kind of doesn't make sense in, in many cases. But it probably makes security sense. For example, I think financially, you probably need one uh, international trading system or one SWIFT. I think that's probably enough. However, I'm pretty sure China is building its own, you know, kind of a financial. Because it, it doesn't trust SWIFT. It observed how SWIFT did damage to Iran uh, under when it was under pressure, uh, arguably from the United States. Uh, so lots of these challenges there. Now go back to the hypothetical extreme cases. Uh, if China or, or the world was shut down and then uh, China has to rely on its own, um, I think. China will definitely face lots of challenges there. That's for sure, because so far China's, lots of China's wealth and success uh, was based on port. 
and and China remains, you know, uh, in a in a very good trading position. Uh, you know, uh, for example, versus uh, United States. Yeah. Um. However, uh, I suppose in that kind of a pressure game, China could probably uh, survive slightly longer than many other countries simply mm-hmm. because it's bigger. And hence, uh, you know, China was able to probably assert its interests a bit further than other countries. Mm-hmm. Many other countries probably wouldn't make the West uh, so uncomfortable uh, because before they could achieve anything, they would have to back up uh, because you observe the South uh, yeah, Southeast Asian countries uh, you know they can easily be beat uh, sometimes by just by capital groups, not right. even by a salvage country. Uh, so and and uh, I think, but China probably also would also watch what Russian is you know doing and suffering from its um, you know uh, activities in Ukraine. Uh, I think that probably also will give Chinese leadership some kind of a cooling down. Uh, reminders that uh, they probably also don't want to go full on uh, in confrontation with the West. So even though you know, um, Russian uh, still has lots of leverage in his hand, like gas uh, and oil, that's power. But uh, I don't think uh, Russian is doing very well in the war. Uh, so I think that's also kind of a reminder for China. Uh, when when the I think the Chinese leadership probably will more careful and regress uh, in doing an analysis before they make any further move. But, you know, one hand does not make a clap. You know, if American or the Western keep on pressuring China on the key essential national security, uh, perceived national security hotspots, especially Taiwan, uh, I just think even she wants wants to back up, he doesn't have a choice. He doesn't have the choice. He has to uh, just increase. Then eventually it becomes a, Ru- a Russian roulette, isn't it? I mean, the two two parts just keeps on playing gambles, and and that will really make our world a more dangerous place. Uh, you you're absolutely right. In fact, on, on, on Taiwan, just quickly, some people will see it as a trap for for mainland China. The, that it needs to avoid while it maneuvers. So that is that is remains a very um, hot hot red button issue. Uh, you you've written in 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 one of your many excellent uh, think pieces uh, that China uh, relates to what what you called a holistic approach to national security, uh, and that is in fact the narrative that comes from from uh, the top in, in the in the party as well. Um, and in your answer to Ali's question, that is exactly what you were talking about, that post-financial crisis of 2008, there, there appeared to be a delink, uh, in the West at least, between well-being and national security. But what you've implied is, from China's perspective, well-being and national security are actually part of the same package. Um, and what in what we in the West called human security. Do you think Ali and I are right in our reading of China's approach to uh, security? Let's not put another adjective for it. And how can China sell that more effectively uh, as, as a way forward for not just the global South, but as you said, but also you know, the global West, which is clearly suffering, and in Britain's case, is rudderless after Brexit. Yeah, um, uh, Anush, that's a that's a good question. But I think uh, if you ask the question to the Chinese leadership, region, their typical answer that we, China is not interested in, in lecturing anyone else. Uh, I'm jokes apart, uh, aside, I, I think that the let's not forget that I think the Party Congress fundamentally the pr- primary. Uh, audience is actually the Chinese people or the Communist Party members. Um, I mean, of course, people like us are, you know, watching that closely uh, and and uh, because we care about China, we care about the world, uh, but it was really in China that, uh, you know, the, the Party Congress report is targeting because these are the people who actually holds the face of the Communist Party of China. Even though, you know, the Communist Party of China is, is presented 
or perceived as a, a mighty powerful party that does not base on the Western style democracy, uh, but it's not immune from the public opinion. Hence, what I say is that no matter how powerful Xi Jinping is, uh, if he lost Taiwan, you know, he would lose the entire China. That's that's for sure, I think. Um, so uh, for for fundamentally, I think we, we can, we, you know, uh, whether or not it's Xi Jinping's personal ambition of the party system, uh, for the Communist Party to be able to implement its grand plan for China, it has to first uh, hold its power. It's the same like if a politician in the West uh, you know, wants to implement their vision, they have to be elected first, or they have to keep their position first. I think, uh, you know, Liz Truss uh, couldn't do anything uh, when, you know, when she's out, out, out from, the, you know, Downing Street. Uh, so for that, uh, I think uh, from the party's perspective, from Xi's perspective, you know, the common prosperity, the, the, the people's well-being, and China's pride. These are the two pillows, uh, actually, to support, you know, his positions there. Um, and along with, for example, along with the, the revolutionary and ideology uh, kind of things there. Uh, so he has to do this together. But for him, uh, this, these two things can be combined together because if China gets stronger and then China holds a more comfortable position internationally that China can do its trade uh, in ways that, uh, you know, it, it can benefit and in ways that it allows it to, you know, uh, to benefit, then these things will uh, benefit, for example, uh, the Chinese government. The Chinese government will probably, you know, from taxation and other things, get more returns and then it can further implement Xi's common prosperity agenda, which I think the key is to reduce inequality. Because if China's economic uh, development rate is, you know, challenging, uh, then fundamentally, if the central government do not have enough money or resources, then it cannot, you know, uh, balance the distribution within the country. And naturally, the country's nation condition is so Diverse without the parties, uh, the, the 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 you know central government's coordination, you will naturally see inequality growth there, like in many other countries. So to consolidate Xi's approach, he has to do that. Um, but I'm not sure for uh, some Western countries could follow China, even if they want to. I don't think they want to follow China in the first place. Um, and, and, and the key challenge there is how much resources that the central government, you know, have. For example, I think the one challenge that the British uh, government facing at the moment is, you know, how can it stimulate, you know, the economic growth on the one hand, and then, you know, keep the inequality not skyrocketing high on the other. That's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, partially because I think the British government does not have some of the policy tools that the Chinese government has, such as a big state-owned enterprise. Um, so without those kind of things, it's difficult to replicate what Xi Jinping is doing there. But I think the West governments, not the Western countries necessarily, but West government does have one convenient to the Chinese government is that they do have a position to retreat. For example, within Conservative Party, if one leader is not popular and does not do very well, the party change a leader. At least, you know, for this week, you see uh, the Conservative uh, Party's rate, even though it's still negative, it's kind of increased a little bit. Uh, and then I don't think the Chi Chinese system would have that kind of flexibility there. So that means all the pressures is on this uh, the, the, the party leadership. And then I suppose that can also be a curse at a certain point. But again, uh, the structure has been already set. I don't think even she's one day say that I want to retire. Uh, I mean, he can retire, but he needs to make arrangement that he couldn't like least trust, just wake up and say, okay, that's enough. 
I'm not going to, you know, continue with, uh, you know, serving the the headline in such an active way. I quit. Um, I I don't think that's a choice I, for China. I find that very interesting. I always remember this saying. It's a funny one. Anush may have heard it before. They say it takes one healthy mummy in nine months, a lot of folic acid to deliver a healthy baby. You cannot have nine mummies each one month to deliver a baby called prosperity. And the problem here is that every month we have, you know, a new um, instability. But I bring our calls and our dialogues with this question to um, bright luminaries and, you know, scholars like yourself. As to if you were to leave one piece of advice to the cinephobes and cinephiles on both camps, what would that be? And while you're thinking about it, I think the world cannot have China on demand. You know, we want you for SDGs and we want you for, you know, poverty eradication. We need you in global fight on climate change, but you still have to play by the rules of our game. It's a little bit too stretched, in my opinion. And India may be watching and saying, what are they going to do to China? And if they move all of these factories to me, what am I going to face in 10 years time or 15 years time from the West? You know, so, but that, those are something for another call, but your piece of advice and wisdom to cinephobes and cinephiles. Well, uh, I think, Ali, if, if I could offer anything, I would say that uh, let's not lose hope because even uh, yeah. there is lots of strategic and structured challenges there. As you mentioned, uh, I was about to say anyway that, for example, uh, this is something that matters to everyone. Uh, this is something we that, lost uh, you. For example, what we lost you for a second. You said something. For example, oh sorry. I mean, for example, the global cooperation in uh, you know taking on climate change. Yeah, this is one area that, for example, China, American, uh, and many developing countries they all argue that we should take actions together. So. There is still overlapping interest there, despite all the challenges there. Uh, so I think if both parties could focus on the parts that at least they can understand each other, they can talk to each other, then uh, that's a good starting point. I and mean, it's inevitable that in every country, in, in, in American, Australia, or in China, there are uh, you know people who emphasize security or the zero sun security more than others. I mean, some people made their career uh, based on those sec those sectors. And I, I mean, it's understandable there's always these people there and we probably need these experts uh, for certain issues there. Let's not, despite all the increasing challenges on the international order there, uh, despite the apparent uh, increasingly different views on lots of things, uh, there is still uh, opportunities for, for collaboration. And I'd say that climate, climate change is, is one of the key areas that it seems that uh, almost everyone agrees on it. Uh, not Donald Trump, but I mean, at least Biden would commit it to that. Uh, I think the, the, the Conservative Party in the UK is still coming that. Uh, even the Australian government, especially now the Labour government, committed to, this, to that. So I think this is one that uh, lots of parties can and uh, you know work together and with some luck maybe they can find some chemistry there and maybe other you know areas can can have some eyes get broken as well um, so if I can leave any advice I would say that let's focus on the bits that we can work together and change and then hopefully there is a solution and inspire inspiration for other areas uh, Dr. Tao, to end on a positive note uh, is 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 sorely missed in the world we live in. So it's wonderful to have your call for focusing on the common good rather than on common differences. This is really, really important. Initially, I said that you were unfolding an ocean in response to Ali's initial question. Well, you've managed to keep Ali and I certainly from drowning, even though you have given us so much insight, not just on the mechanics of China's uh, thinking, but also the philosophies of China's thinking, and also 
the opportunities, the potholes and the challenges that China, not just China, but the rest of us face going forward. So the way that if you unpack such complex issues, and I'm very conscious that and I throw them at our at our experts and, and your handling of them has been marvelous. You didn't bat them away, you put them in your basket, we weaved it and they give us back something even better to give us a float in your ocean. So I'm 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 really grateful to you, you for having responded to us so positively, but also so insightfully about the takeaways from the 20th Party Congress, about what it need, means for President Xi to be reelected, and not to fear his reelection, but also see it as evolution of Chinese political system and where that sits in the international system. So really grateful to you for giving time to us and also for the way in which you've responded to, to our probing questions, Dr. Tao. Much yeah, appreciated. Well, Thank you very Thank much. You. It was as if we were batting to you, but you addressed them all with Tai Chi, so seamlessly. <laughs> so thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anush and Ali for being so generous to me. And, and I also learned much from, you know, our conversation. And I will definitely watch the rest uh, of the, the theories because I'm sure I will learn much from there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so You're much. You're very kind.